Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. I'm so pleased to announce the speakers for our next session, who will be discussing the economic impact and labor market challenges that are affected by long COVID. Um, as you've heard from some of our previous uh, speakers, that there's a huge ripple effect, and we're going to discuss some of the size of those ripples and where those ripples are going in this panel. Please join me in welcoming Philippa Dunn. Philippa, are you on the ICU? Hello. Holly Wade, Dana Peterson, and our moderator, Kathleen Stevenson. Good afternoon, and um, I am just going to give a very brief uh, introduction uh, of our speakers, and then we can jump right into um, the meat of the discussion. So we will start with um, Holly Wade. She is the executive director of uh, the NFIB Research Center, where she conducts original research and studies public policy effects on small businesses. And being a practitioner in economics, I can tell you that uh, every month we're looking <laughs> forward for that particular uh, report. So, you know, we thank you so much for this, you know, contribution to uh, economics. We will then um, have Dana talk to us. Unfortunately, she's not in the room, um, but we'll see her um, on screen. And Dana Peterson is the chief economist and center leader of economy, strategy, and finance of the conference board. Um, Dana joined the conference board um, not so long ago, I think, from City where she was for many years, um, the North America economist, but more importantly, I remember her great contribution as being the global economist at Citi. And then we'll have um, uh, also uh, on uh, the virtual side, uh, Philippa Dunn, who is co-editor of uh, two independent macroeconomic letters, the Lissio report, and um, we've followed her writings for many, many years on the Lissio report um, with a trading focus. And then she also is um, the, doing the sidelines bulletin, which I don't know. So I have to look into that because uh, I really do like following what Philippa is writing, um, where she takes a longer perspective. So we are going to shift gear a little bit from um, what we heard this morning in the sense that even though long COVID is difficult to define, um, you really do get the sense that it is an exact science, or at least that was a side that we heard, the exact science. Economics, we like to call ourselves scientists, but it's social sciences. So it's not as precise, perhaps. It has a feel to it. Um, some people might say art. I'm not sure it's quite that yet. Yeah. But uh, certainly, we have um, many different views. You put two economists in a room, and we have about six different views. So that kind of uh, adds, if you will, to the momentum. So today, we are going to discuss really the economic impact, particularly on the labor market of long COVID. And I think that we want to um, think more in terms of uh, not just long COVID, but maybe the pandemic and long COVID and what is likely to happen going forward. So we have three different views or the from perspectives, I should say. The first one, as I mentioned, um, we will hear from Holly Wade. And the perspective there is for small businesses. With Dana, we'll focus much more particularly um, with her work at the conference board, it would be large businesses. And then we'll, we'll circle right back to um, Philippa to hear more about uh, how this, all this meshes together, if you will, in the labor market. So with that, Holly, it's all yours. Great, thank you. It's um, wonderful to be on the panel with everyone and being here in New York um, and seeing everybody in person. I love these hybrid 
um, events that allow for everybody to participate. Um, I have a slide deck, but there it is. You just say it and you go. get it. It's amazing. <laughs> um, the National Federation of Independent Business, we represent roughly 300,000 small firms across the country in every industry. And we've been serving our members about economic conditions and business operations since 1973, thanks to our chief economist, Bill Dunkelberg. And he had created this, this quarterly at the beginning survey to assess the health of the small business sector and what's happening with this um, part of our, of our economy. And over the last two years, small firms have told us every month about the changes that they're experiencing um, within, their, within their community, how they're adjusting operations in their firm to deal with COVID staffing shortages um, and, and continuing now, certainly uh, one of the, the main concerns is inflation, but it's all wrapped up in the economic shocks that we've been experiencing over the last two years. Um, this is our headline measure of the small business sector, the health of the small business economy, our optimism index, which, um, which is a, a 10 questions within our survey. And right now we are back down to the lowest level that we've experienced since April 2020. So right when the pandemic was hitting and all of those shutdowns were occurring, we're back down to that level, unfortunately. A lot of this has to do with their concerns with inflation, but much of it also has to do with staffing shortages and not being able to hire and fill those open positions. Um, while there are two employment questions within the index that are boosting the index number up, this, the question related to general business conditions over the next six months, whether they think it'll improve or get worse is what is contributing to the decline in the optimism index on the next slide. And I'm not able to forward, let's see, maybe I can. Um, Just do this. I know, it, it, it miraculously appeared before. Um, <laughs> Look at, just looking at the index, I will go through some of the components within the index. The general business condition question that we've been asking has been declining over the last um, three months or since 2020, but declining precipitously to the historic lowest level that we've seen um, over the 48 years of the survey. And this has certainly a lot to do with inflation and the staffing shortage that they're experiencing. And unfortunately for small business owners, there are very few tools available to them in trying to navigate these challenges and they are faced with a number of challenges. We also have a COVID-19 survey series that we've asked a number of questions related specifically to COVID and their experience in, um, in employment and, and staffing shortages. And one of the questions in the second to last survey was related to the increased cases of Omicron and, and the surge in COVID cases um, over the holidays. Oh, here we go. And many of them said that it did impact them. Many of them said that absenteeism was contributing to their staffing shortage and problems keeping their operations open with dependable workforce coming in every day. And so these challenges are what small business owners are facing, are having to navigate and adjusting business operations accordingly. So here you can see the outlook for business conditions are, um, had, are at historic low levels, um, breaking the 48 year record, unfortunately, and it's been a per precipitous drop since the beginning of the year. And then looking also at a good time to expand. So we ask every month whether they think it's a good time to expand. 
in the next three months. And we've seen, again, historic low levels of owners saying that it's a good time to expand. A lot of this, again, has to do with staffing shortages and inflationary pressures that they are experiencing. Single most important problem, we give them a, a, a list of 10 and labor costs and labor quality. Labor quality is outpacing costs. You know, they are able to, they're increasing compensation, they're increasing um, wages for those open positions and still not able to attract the level of applicants that they need to fill these positions. And so still about a quarter of small business owners are saying that labor quality is their single most important problem. Right now, about a third are saying inflation. So that's kind of the predominant or the headline problem for many small employ or small business owners right now. Um, but labor quality is still up there. And importantly, right now, staffing shortages are um, a, a, a significant challenge for small businesses. However, they were pro staffing shortages and labor quality and filling open positions um, were at very high levels before the pandemic. So it's not that this is a new issue, it has been exacerbated, but small firms have had to navigate um, how to operate their business with a lot of unfilled job openings before the pandemic and now again um, in the recovery. So here we're looking at unfilled job openings. You can see where we were before the pandemic and where we are now, certainly exacerbated. Um, the, the challenges that they have here, but it is nothing new. They were experiencing this in 2017, 18, 19, and 20, um, right up to the run-up of, of COVID. And then job creation plans, um, it's fallen a little bit in the last few quarters, but we still see very high levels of those owners looking to create jobs in the next three months, whether they're able to follow through and fill those positions um, remains certainly challenging. And especially, you know, going forward with, uh, you know, surges in COVID cases um, and, and all of the, the uh, implications of uh, increased COVID cases. I wanted to point this out. I think this is important in the context of this conversation related to COVID is the percent of small firms offering health insurance. So with the pandemic and all of the, the, the um, you know, medical issues with employees and being out sick with um, COVID related illness, small firms historically have been those who are least likely to offer health insurance because of high costs. So right now we've, or over, the, um, you know, about 2020 to 2000, uh, uh, 2013, we've seen a significant drop in the percentage of small firms who are offering health insurance. Generally speaking, these are newer firms that are less likely to offer from the start of business operations. And so that demographic has been falling off and we've seen, uh, you know, with small firms, creative destruction environment of small firms. Um, that's their nature of coming in and out of business. But with the surge of new business formations, it will be interesting to see going forward whether they are less or more likely to offer health insurance as a benefit if they are an, employ an employer company employer business. Um, but right now, only about a third of those employer businesses under 50 employees are offering health insurance. And what this looks like and how this impacts their workforce and absenteeism and all of those things, um, it, you know, is of certainly of concern for, for owners and how to pay for these costs related to COVID and illnesses among their workforce. And then this is the question that we asked in the latest COVID survey, whether the, the surge over the, the holidays season, um, this or two quarters ago, um, if it impacted their business. And many of them said that it did impact their business. Only 29% said that it did not. Of those who were impacted, whether it was impacting sales, yes. 
but more importantly, that it was impacting employee work attendance. And so going forward, this is likely to be something that they're going to have to continue to navigate with those getting COVID, becoming ill, but also those long-term COVID cases where there are, um, you know, there are illnesses and, and health concerns um, related to those who have had COVID. And this will play an important role because, of course, the staffing shortages um, continue. So I just wanted to highlight that to give a basic overview of the small business landscape related to staffing shortages, where they are, and how COVID is impacting them. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, you mentioned, and before we turn uh, the mic to uh, to Dana, just wanted to um, say, ask you a couple of things. One is that you mentioned, you know, the um, staffing shortages. We know that in uh, a recovery, a cyclical recovery, there's always tremendous friction in the labor market, and it always takes a little bit of time to uh, to see those frictions essentially uh, work themselves out. We have here, and not just in the US, but elsewhere as well, we have here the depiction of extremely tight labor markets. But it appears to me that a lot of that tightness and labor um, sh or staffing shortages is, is due not so much from um, healthy recovery as such, but because we do face other challenges. You mentioned COVID, um, the absenteeism. Um, we don't know how much long COVID is affecting this, but it seems to me that these challenges, uh, the geographical challenges um, are part of uh, this friction that probably will take longer to um, ease themselves out. Would you Absolutely. agree with that? Absolutely. I think the absenteeism problem cannot be overstated when it comes to small firms being able to adjust business operations and have a, a dependable, healthy workforce going forward. Um, I think it's also one of the reasons that those who are early retirees might not want to come back into the workforce. We still have over a quarter of those prime age workers, between a quarter and a third, who aren't fully vaccinated. And so the threat of becoming ill and having those higher risks of long-term COVID um, uh, uh, kind of repercussions is, I think, a significant consideration for those who have retired early to come back in the workforce. And you know, with the significance of the labor shortage, you know, that's what a lot of small businesses are hoping for, that the return of those folks who left the labor market will you know, resurface and come back with the, the, you know, kind of the carrot of higher compensation and, and things like that. But I think the threat of illness with the, you know, continued waves of COVID and also the threat and better understanding of long-term COVID repercussions, it's going to be a heavy lift. Right. And we've, we've noticed that, you know, we talk about women coming back to the labor force. The labor participation rate has been low, but it's Absolutely. inching slightly up now. So that could mean that, you know, maybe there is uh, the early retirees, as you mentioned, might be coming back because, you know, quite frankly, if you retire early at the age of 50 with, <laughs> um, you know, um, yeah, expectation, living expectations being sure. uh, fairly high, um, it's hard to finance that, isn't it? But that brings me to Dana, because Dana, you are looking at um, larger corporations. And do you see the same challenges that um, um, Holly just mentioned, but just essentially blown up, if you will? Um, yes, uh, firms, large firms are seeing a lot of the same challenges. And actually, we just posted a survey of CEO confidence yesterday um, so I have some slides, too, to share. That's OK. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. OK, so let's share. Many of the things that small firms are, are challenged with, as Holly mentioned, larger firms are also experiencing those things, but by a multiple. 
Um, so we did our, our quarterly survey of CEOs, um, roughly 133 CEOs uh, from the business council. So these are big multinational Fortune 500 firms. And um, about 133 of them responded. And we ran our survey from late April through early May. And really, you know, this is what we're seeing. Confidence just really collapsed. It's back into negative territory. Anything below 50 is negative. Um, and it's it's just as bad as it was during the pandemic. So um, big CEO, CEOs of big firms are, are very uh, morose at this point. Um, you know, we're seeing that show up in the stock market indices. Uh, I think some of it has to do with the fact that, um, you know, conditions six months ago were so much better for them relative to now. I think part of that's the fact that last year, a lot of consumer spending and activity was was uh, supercharged by easy monetary and fiscal policy. And so, yes, firms saw many firms saw double digit profits. And now we don't have that easy, monet easy fiscal policy and monetary policy is tightening. Um, and so firms are seeing the back end of that, <laughs> that big waterbed effect. And so for many of them, they're saying conditions are so much worse, um, not only in general, but also for their, their own industries. Um, but, you know, as the economists, I'd say, well, you know, the economy was growing around 6% last year, really close to 6%. That is not sustainable. And so we have to come down from that closer to something that is sustainable, which is probably, you know, in the 2% range. But still, that feels like a big downshift if you're a firm. Um, but also, uh, businesses are thinking that expectations six months ahead are, are going to be even worse. In fact, a number of them, we asked them a special question, a number of them are anticipating a recession either later this year or sometime next year. Um, and that's a function of a, a number of things, including monetary policy. How quickly and how hard is the Fed going to go in terms of raising interest rates? Is the Fed going to go into... Um, restrictive territory, which would potentially put the Fed funds rate above 3%, um, maybe even this year. So also geopolitics, uh, what's going on with the war in Ukraine in terms of stoking inflation globally and disrupting supply chains. And let's not forget the ongoing pandemic um, situation in China with shutdowns of entire cities that are affecting supply chains globally. Um, so CEOs are looking at all of this and they're saying, look, a recession may be around the corner. That's not the conference board's base case right now, um, but certainly lots of folks are, are starting to fold that into their base case. And, you know, we're looking at all the different combination of situations that could get you there. Um, digging a little bit more deeply into the survey, um, businesses are still, most are still saying that they're having difficulty hiring qualified people. Um, so this reflects uh, labor shortages in a sense, um, uh, but um, we saw a little bit of that come off relative to the first quarter. But still in all, businesses are saying, you know, we're looking for very specific skills and we're not finding it. So that speaks to one solution is maybe you should lower your skills expectations and offer to train people as a solution. Um, more are still expecting to expand their workforce. So that's good news for the labor market, especially as the Fed is, is addressing inflation um, and trying to wrestle inflation to the ground. Really good news is the fact that the labor market is still um, very strong um, and most people are working. And if we did see some uptick in the unemployment rates from a very low level. Um, but wages are still, you know, for many businesses, they are grappling with higher wages, again, related to labor shortages. So it's not just a small firm thing, it's a big firm thing. And even the big firms are challenged by this with 68% expecting that they're going to have to increase wages by three to 5% and still a quarter expecting wage increases of over 5%. So this is really tremendous. This is a huge issue for firms. Um, and, and we asked them, what are you gonna be doing with those input costs. I'll get there in a second. In terms of capital spending, the good news is that they're still looking to spend. And we saw in the first quarter of this uh, year, GDP was negative with the headline print, but underneath businesses really did spend on capital equipment and intellectual property. And so this is indicating that we're gonna still have those supports from businesses um, so long as they don't, well, and even though they think we're gonna we're headed towards a recession. So there's some cognitive different, dissonance here. Um, with a special question uh, on inflation, we asked them, what do you think the Fed's going to do in terms of tightening monetary policy? An overwhelming 50% said inflation is going to come down over the next couple of years. 
but we're going to have a short, uh, mild recession, you know, maybe a couple of quarters of negative, slightly negative GDP growth with some increase in the unemployment rate. Uh, but that, then the Fed's going to come back and, and <laughs> cut rates. I mean, you know, as an economist, I'd say, well, why doesn't the Fed just pause at some point? But you know, this is this is coming from our CEOs, and they think that the Fed is serious about tackling inflation, getting the inflation tar- inflation back to the target at two percent, and that means pulling out all the stops and potentially going into a brief uh, downturn. Um, so this is what CEOs are anticipating. Um, in terms of how they are managing all these rising input costs. An overwhelming percentage of them are just passing it on to customers. And that's really true in the U.S. When we ask uh, CEOs outside of the U.S., you get different stories. So, for example, in Asia, especially China, they're cutting costs because they can't pass those higher costs, um, input costs off to the consumer. But certainly in the U.S., overwhelmingly passing it on to the consumer. Um, what are they doing about rising labor costs? Well, um, they, I mean, they are increasing wages. So they're capitulating. And so this is something that the Fed is very concerned about, that we're going to have a wage price spiral. And certainly if if you have enough large businesses raising wages for each of your classes of, of, of workers, then that's going to provide even more impetus for stronger demand, higher prices. And then those very same employees are going to come back and ask for higher wages. And then I think just a couple of more things here. Um, in terms of the supply chain, they're diversifying uh, their global supply chain. Certainly in the U.S., Treasury Secretary Yellen said we need to friend shore, meaning we need to diversify our supply chains um, to trade with uh, countries and economies that we're friendly with. So, for example, in the U.S., the UMCA is a great choice. Right, but there's still the challenge. You can't completely diverse away from diversify away from China because China has that the vertical infrastructure um, for effective manufacturing. Um, and then I think this is my last question. <laughs> I'm going to make it my last one. Uh, oh, looks like there are two more. Um, but essentially, more than one third of CEOs say that um, the biggest challenge facing their company. It, in regards to the war in Ukraine is sanctions, right? And certainly many big businesses, uh, many of the businesses that are our members have pulled out of Russia um, uh, or limited their operations in Russia. And so they're very significantly impacted by the war in Ukraine. Um, and in terms of their thoughts about, you know, the geopolitical landscape, you know, many of them think we're going to have this bipolar world where you have the U.S. and its allies in China and its allies, including Russia, and everyone else is going to have to choose sides. And so that's really significant if you're a multinational, where you have to figure out which side you're going to have to be on. And so I'm going to stop here. Um, but essentially, that's you know many of the issues that small businesses are facing, large businesses are facing them too, plus the geopolitics. Thank you, Dana. This was this is a very interesting uh, survey that that you have, and uh, what what seems to be you know happening there in the first few slides that you had there's a disconnect between you know they're feeling essentially suicidal here you know with this <laughs> plummeting you know index, but then you know the expectation that inflation is going to um, come down. So you say to yourself, "Hello, why being that negative then?" Right. Well, I mean, they're associating inflation ex- inflation coming down with the Fed tightening aggressively. And so they view the tightening as being the source of the future recession, uh, more so than, say, you know, uh, intensification of the war or the housing market going kaput in the U.S. or recessions abroad that kind of feed through the U.S. through um, uh, uh expectation, I'm sorry, through confidence and trade channels. They're really focused on the Fed here. Right. But, you know, even so, I mean, it's just a mild recession that is expected as opposed to, so you cannot assume then that they think that the Fed is going to be very aggressive. They might, it might, you know, move a little bit above the neutral to be on a tighter side, but not excessively so, right? Um, and <clears throat> what I found um, uh, fascinating is is the fact that 
you know, at the same time, um, <clears throat> these companies are willing to invest in capital. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, that, um, that's the shocking thing in the survey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but and in a way, I, I mean, you know, Holly, you were saying that uh, um, in terms of is it a good time to um, expand? I wasn't sure whether you referred to expansion of um, uh, their labor force or expansion in capital investment. It's a general question, so it could mean however they're interpreting that, but it would yeah. likely be expansion of their facility, which would include expansion of their workforce also. So probably an incorporation of both of them. Um, and right now they can't find anybody to expand their, their facility, even if there were opportunities to do so. When we ask, many of them are saying that they're losing sales opportunities because of these challenges, which just increases the frustration of the whole situation. And you know, it's what is what is interesting here, and I think that it it comes out from both uh, surveys, if you will, is is the fact that the challenges, you know, the typical challenges that we have um, when you shift gear in an economic cycle has now been exacerbated by the other externalities, if you will, if I may call the pandemic an externality and, uh, and uh, the geopolitical situation with the war in Ukraine, as well as the supply side situation with, um, with China. And the supply side, if, if this were to continue, obviously is going to have a negative impact on, on, uh, on growth here, which only exacerbate these um, these frictions, if you will, in in the labor market, um, and and this um, and and we'll come back to all this in the discussion. But I just want to uh, bring in uh, Philippa because um, you know what all this is uh, is seems to be indicating is that there is a disparity here between costs, projected costs, if you will, um, in uh, the labor market. You know with the, we have to increase wages um, and the participation rates that we see in um, in in the labor market as well. So, um, Philippa, do you want to to just uh, take us through some of uh, your thoughts on on that? Yes, I, I'd be excuse me, <clears throat> I'd be very happy to, and also I'm very happy to be here. Um, I was going to frame my remarks in tethering, since you talked about what is economics to what I like as the definition of the, as the study of the running of the home. So the same act as in ecology, which is the study of the home. So that's what I was thought of some things that might help us get through these labor shortages, both for employers and for employees. Um, it also sort of fits in with um, Peter Hattis, I'm sorry, point that you can't solve a problem if you can't articulate it. Um, and um, that we need to have an honest discussion with the American people that really accepts the suffering, especially of those, or maybe not especially, but including of those who are trying to stay on the job with into episodic disabilities. Um, so David Kotak said that I was going to talk about job openings, and I'm actually not going to, but I did want to start with a quick anecdote, which was that um, Ken Simonson, who's the chief economist at the Contractors Trade Association, uh, recently mentioned that he thought that the extremely low vaccination rate among construction workers was what one of the things driving their record high job openings rate. And so he's not talking, sorry, about- um, is calling. <laughs> he's not talking about um, people not being vaccinated, he's talking about them being sick. So that's, I would guess. So that's coming from the employer side. Um, so it's for a long time, we've been in a position where we can't afford to lose any more workers. And it's obviously been exasperated now during the pandemic. Um, we have demographic, demographic pressures and we also have um, weak net immigration. Um, so I'm proposing that we have a real collaboration between policymakers and employers to work to keep people who are trying to work in the labor force. So I'm not, I'm, 
I'm thinking of it a little bit more of the point of view of the worker, because if you go out and I mean, if you know anyone who has long COVID or if you go out and read the anecdotes, a lot of a lot of these people are people who were working full time, big plans for themselves. And suddenly they're having trouble on certain days where they just cannot work. Um, so one of the things is for many years, policymakers who study our disability system have recommended some structural changes. And these include Mary Daly at the San Francisco Fed and her often colleague, um, Richard Berghauser at Cornell. And they have stressed that there are examples from Europe that show that you can structure the system so that it encourages work and it makes it possible for workers to work as much as they can instead of the position our system does now, where no matter what it says on the website, if a worker who is getting disability payments tries to get back into the system and fails, they have to start all over again. So there are countries in Europe that have experimented with allowing you to work as much as you can and then making up the difference. So that's People have been talking about that for decades, but it always falls off the radar screen. So this is a chance to do something about that. Then another thing is to rethink how we value our care workers. Um, there's another Mary Daly, believe it or not, in Oxford. Um, and she's, she's written and spoken about how, especially in the UK and in the US, we tend to think of care workers as unproductive and we undervalue them. And, they are also certain care workers are really lagging in terms of wage gains. Um, so to put that idea into perspective, the big percentage gains that are projected in certain tech firms like wind turbines get the headlines, but those often just work out to a couple of, you know, a few thousand workers. The BLS official projections for the next 10 years is that we, we're gonna need a million home health and personal care workers. Um, and that's actually eight times the, the distant second, which is health managers. And then you have nurses and then you have physicians assistants. So the biggest projections are all in healthcare. And this of course is an area where people are very vulnerable to having long COVID because many were exposed before they could be vaccinated, et cetera. So that's um, that th those workers, we're really going to have to work with them, and they often have the weakest voices. So that's another policy thing. Um, and also, the effects of long COVID will really exacerbate the regional and demographic disparities. Um, that was really driven home this morning when people, the science was highlighting the women's vulnerability to long COVID. But another problem is say the Southern states already have a higher disability share than the nation as a whole. And they also have very high projected infection rates. So that's another thing policymakers are gonna to have to think about. Um, and then we also, in the paper that I wrote with Melissa and Emily, we also did, um, we took a look at the projected costs that Melissa came up with as a sort of burden on the labor forces, because there's, there's a lot of variation in the diff among the states by labor force participation. It runs from the mid 50s in certain states up to 72 in non-state of Washington, DC. Uh, yes. And um, so if you take the number of cases that are projected, I mean, I'm sorry, if you take the costs that are projected by state and divide them by the people who are actively engaged with the labor force, could be unemployed, could be employed, but they're planning to work. And then rank that as a share of the national average cost. You get, to me, a real measure of vibrancy and disparity. So Maine has the lowest rank. So their, their, their cost per worker is about 57% of the national average. And then you get into 
122% in West Virginia, it gets up higher, the high 20s in Mississippi. So these are states that are gonna be really struggling to deal with the costs, lost wages, just the, the problems that are associated with these episodic disabling um, conditions. So that's not to be beating up on the states, it's meant as a red flag for the policymakers. And the other thing is, um, and you both sort of touched on this, but small businesses are well understood to be extremely beneficial for our more disadvantaged communities. And they made some real gains during the pandemic. There's, there's a lot of noise there, but that's pretty clear. And so that's something also that we really need to commit to protecting. So I guess- Well, we that's a whole menu, isn't it? <laughs> to, um, and, and I think you're right to uh, really focus on this notion that, you know, you just have to have this framework of policies uh, in place. But one thing that um, uh, comes to mind is that you, you seem to focus on this relationship or lack thereof, I should say, between the public and the private sectors. And how can we, in fact, bridge that uh, divide? Um, is it the role of um, large corporations, Dana, or smaller ones, small businesses? Um, and, and more importantly, where do we begin? Do we begin at the grassroots level? Even, and even though um, it seems to me that this should be a federal type of approach in order for being able to leveling out the disparities that you see between states, regions, et cetera. But we know that that's a very difficult endeavor. So there is this tension, if you will, between efforts at the grassroots level or the state level and at the federal level to put in place, if you will, the policies that you were alluding to. So I'm not sure that I meant to imply the difference between the public and private sectors, although obviously it's there. Um, I, I think the disability side, and I think that's the most important piece, has to be at a, an actual change of the how, how the social security DI system is structured. Mm. So that people can be, so that it recognizes that disability is not black and white. People, can work more on some days and less on others. So that to me would be the most important thing to do. Um, and then the other thing is one of the things they do in Europe, and this, this is not in my wheelhouse, but um, to, to rank employers by, to, to increase their payments into the disability insurance system, if a, num a large number of their workers end up on disability. Because there are a lot of things that employers can do to make it possible for people to stay in the labor force. And you know, we heard earlier, we don't know how many people, when, when we stopped the, the paper, the low, the low estimate was 7 million. It, you know, the CDC doubled the, their projected infection rate since then. So, you know, how many people is this? It's to everyone's advantage to make these changes. So on the private side, employers are, need, are going to need to get in there and really listen to their employees. And employees themselves are going to have, they're going to have to seek help. And if they need legal help, they're going to have to do that. And um, then the, on the government side to build out the system so that it can accommodate people who are trying to stay in the labor force and trying to return to full-time work. Because one of the points that I think didn't get made this morning, which many people are really surprised by, is that these syndromes are exacerbated if you try to do more than you can. So if you're not taking time to rest, you're making it more likely that you may never recover. Yes, and, and of course the 
the difficulty is that we have this conversation at the time when we know that um, there is very little fiscal room, if you will, for um, policymakers to help out in formulating and uh, in um, defining a new environment towards what you're describing. Um, oh, and you well, know, on the yeah, go ahead. No, you. I'm sorry. You go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say that you know. So on the fiscal side, you know, it's all restrictive now, as Dana mentioned, and on the monetary policy side, the the focus is really on on inflation, even to the point of ignoring the possibilities of these supply chain. Uh, disruption that could continue because of what we see out of China. So um, it 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 doesn't bode well, if you will, for a discussion whereby we need more um, help, if you will, uh, from the federal government and 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 the policymakers to to have the mindset, you know, shift towards uh, thinking in uh, along the lines that that you describe. And one thing that's really encouraging that came out of some of these European studies is that the policies that put the onus on the workers and the employers to keep working actually end up with higher employment rates. And so if you have what we have, that once any of these studies they never talk about trying to get people who are on disability back into the labor force because it's really hard. So they instead focus on how to keep people in the labor force and changing these policies does keep, keep people in. So in terms of cost, it's not necessarily more expensive. It could end up to be less expensive in terms of expenditures. Yeah, as an anecdote, it's it's quite interesting. So you were referring to some of the policies that were adopted uh, in um, during the pandemic in um, in in Europe, um, in Germany, and and in France, and in the Nordics as well. Um, is to to keep you know to to allow the companies to keep their employees. Um, as opposed to here, whereby the money was being distributed to um, to the people, so um, it, it, there's a big difference there. And what that seemed to have happened in some areas is that it allowed some companies to really focus then on the next step, which is you know the digitalization um, of the economy. Um, so it, I, I find that very very interesting because it does. It's a very different framework, but um, it has allowed that shift, if you will, in terms of, you know, collective thinking. But uh, Dana, back to you. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. And then, no, I just wanted to ask uh, Dana what um, she hears with regard to, um, you know, the the possible solutions, if you will, um, with regard to in 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 larger corporations. I mean. You know, we all know that inflation is this imbalance between supply and demand. So if you can't do much about supply because of the, you know, um, supply chain disruptions, what you do is you, you know, force demand to slow down. Um, what is what is the, the general view in that respect? Is that being um, kind of uh, put... Is that one of the input into this very negative um, performance of the index? Well, I, I think, um, you know, for, for a lot of firms, especially larger firms, they are thinking more about automation as a solution. Um, you know, for now, many of them have, you know, raised wages, but they're, they're seeing the limits of that, right? And at some point, they're going to start pushing back. And we've already seen the pushback. And, you know, Holly can attest to this, too. A lot of smaller firms are also looking at automation. You know, at a small firm, it's, you know, a laptop at a restaurant or you use your cell phone to address the menu, choose what you want. And one server comes out right with bigger firms. It's even more grandiose in terms of the the automating that's being done. Um, and that's why we're seeing so much investment in in the IP um, and equipment, because firms are realizing that, um, you know, in order to keep labor, 
you do have to provide lots of, lots of options, including higher wages, greater benefits, more flexibility, remote work, all those kinds of things. But even beyond that, um, if you can't find the workers, especially for um, these kind of low skilled, low wage type jobs, the next option is automation. Um, so I don't, I don't mention, I would say from a business perspective, would be something positive that they would look forward to, certainly from a labor market, from the, the workers perspective, um, it can be a threat if you're not trained on how to work with a new automated system, or you're one of the people who repairs the automated system. Now, and just following up on what Dana said, you know, when we've talk to our members. Small business owners are absolutely doing the same thing. They are trying to automate and streamline processes as much as possible. A lot of the challenges small firms have that are a bit different from larger firms is the, the finding automated processes in a smaller scale that are often designed for larger context. So whether you have a more automated way of making burgers or, you know, things like that, that you would need a large space in a restaurant. And this is just an example of one of those um, issues that some small firms are challenged with is the, the scale of what you can purchase to, um, to integrate into a small firm versus having something larger that can fit into a larger or medium-sized firm. Um, but they certainly are trying every way possible, definitely with the menus for restaurants, um, you know, those more labor-intensive industries, um, you know, are trying their best to adjust business operations accordingly and to, you know, kind of do more with less staff than they had before. Um, I think one of the main differences, though, with small firms and larger firms when it comes to COVID and COVID-related illnesses and how they're able to tackle that um, is the inaffordability of health insurance that small firms aren't able to offer at the rates that obviously just almost every large firm offers health insurance and, you know, a, a package of health related benefits um, and small firms are really struggling to be able to afford that benefit for their employees. And if they are on a scaled back version of health insurance um, for many of them. So I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges facing small firms is that disconnect of not being able to offer health insurance and, and having their employees um, have access to, to, medical care um, that larger firms, you know, would be able to provide. So the affordability of health insurance, I think is going to be an exacerbated problem related to COVID. So Holly, do you think that we are looking at a, uh, uh, almost like a regime change in terms of small businesses? I mean, small businesses historically have been looked upon as really the the employers, the creation of jobs in this economy. And what you're suggesting is if we have a shift towards you know, more automation, that kind of waters down a bit that you know, legacy, doesn't it? Or is it just- It does, although I think there's such an imbalance now with the number of job openings and those in the labor market that it would take a lot of automation to get that back into balance. Um, to to ease up the staffing shortages that they are experiencing. So I don't know that in the immediate term that's a, you know a threat to small firms right now or a threat to those who would apply for jobs at small firms. Um, but that is certainly one of the ways that they are trying to figure out how to make those adjustments. Um, but it is so out of balance right now that it would take a lot to to you know, shift it in a way that's meaningful. And I, I suspect, I mean, Philippa, you had mentioned um, um, healthcare workers. Uh, and there again, I mean, you know, there are uh, opportunities, of course, for automation, but by and large, relative to other industries, this is uh, less of a uh, um, productivity-driven type of uh, sector, isn't it? Yes, and also, um... The home health care workers, that's one of the places that cannot be automated. Um, and having shortages there, and a lot of those are actually small firms that are managing these workers. Um, 
that also impacts people who have family members who have long COVID trying to get back to work. So that's that also has rippling effects. And I was saying here also with construction workers being low, that's that's a high economic multiplier. So sure. you have a lot of shortages in construction jobs, then that's going to ripple out into the economy. That's about the highest multiplier. So, right. yeah. Although one anecdote, when I was in China, um, there was the development of this uh, robot that could carry on a conversation for elderly people. Um, and at the time, it was you know a conversation that could last 20 minutes, and they were trying to develop it so that it would last a bit longer so that it fought against the loneliness of uh, elderly people. I thought it was a fascinating uh, new developments into uh, the automation in, you know, home care um, uh, sector. But um, time is, is moving on, even though we are having a good time, it seems to be, you know, disappearing on us. And I certainly don't want to um, go on without uh, giving the uh, opportunity to our uh, audience to ask questions. Um, so I'll just turn to the audience and uh, find out if uh, you have any questions for our speakers. And uh, I will be almost like uh, in an auction. I will say one, <laughs> two, and then, then I put down the hammer, three. Any questions? No, I think that, you know, you are just so clear with everything that you're saying. But um, just one, um, one question for the three of you. Over the next 12 months, what, and I'll start uh, with you, Philippa, and then work, Dana, and then you, Holly. What do you think is the biggest challenge um, for easing the, uh, number one, the labor force uh, um, shortage, but, uh, and also, you know, how do you see the evolution of uh, if we have another wave of COVID um, affecting that particular view? Well, I think over the next however many years, we should be prepared for another pandemic. That's one of the things that I've been thinking about. And now I wasn't really reading the news today, but I say we have some monkey pox coming over. Um, so I think keeping people in the workforce um, and also getting rid of a lot of these barriers, like it's becoming more and more well known that people don't need college degrees to do a lot of the jobs where they're currently shut out. There's been a lot of improvement there. People are getting into the forest who don't have college degrees and guess what? They're doing great. So I think that rethinking the kind of restrictive, and I all, all sometimes think of that as just an, an algorithm mistake. Somehow that got into the job application software. Um, so just to rethink things so we're really sure that we're bringing in anyone we can. And Dana? I agree with everything Philippa said, and I would add on flexibility um, in terms of how we um, enable the labor force to operate. So things like hybrid work is super important. If we do have another pandemic and we have to kind of shelter in place, businesses know how to do that. But also um, being flexible to make sure that there's enough time to be in the office, such, especially for younger workers who want to have the networking and the interaction and the training, especially if you don't need a college degree. So I think co corporations, and this is so important for CEOs, need to be really flexible about um, the labor force and the labor market in general and how they treat the people who work for them. Right. But, you know, um, you're talking about specific industries, right, that can afford to have the hybrid uh, model when some, you know, you just have to be um, on site and that becomes a little bit more challenging, doesn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, you know, it's going to be that that model is going to be much easier for the larger firms who can afford to have to, you know, make sure everyone has a laptop and certainly for the types of industries 
that don't require interaction with the public. Um, but it's going to be much more challenging for your smaller and medium sized firms that don't have the money to invest in those types of things. But you can be flexible in other areas, certainly with respect to hours, especially when you're thinking about getting women back into the labor market. Women care about three things, the market wage, child care options and flexibility. And so I think that's and it's also very important for men, too. Um, so I think that, you know, like that regardless of the size of the business, you can find ways to be flexible. So do you think, Holly, that in your space, the flexibility is there? I think for where they can accommodate flexibility, they have been doing that over the last two years and are continuing to adjust. Um, you know, thankfully, that is one of the kind of cornerstone benefits of small business. They're able to reinvent themselves pretty quickly when they need to. And then also just the surge in new business formations and what those new businesses look like as far as starting out with this new way of operating their business so that they don't have to adjust from one system that they've been that they've been operating with for the last you know 10 20 years they're starting off at this new baseline of flexibility and designing their business in this environment that's so uncertain and challenging in many ways but that is again the benefit of small firms is that they are flexible they do come in and out of operating business And it'll be very interesting to see in the next couple of years what this new cohort, cohort of new businesses um, that we're seeing show up in census that we've never seen um, in, in recent history look like in the next couple of years and how they operate and we will be surveying them. <laughs> well, and, you know, that is, in my mind, a very optimistic note. Um, so perhaps we can expect that this uh, precipitous fall in uh, the yes. index makes a v-shaped recovery absolutely um you know i think once things start to stabilize a little bit and they're not so focused on just day to day having to adjust on the spot to either inflation pressures or staffing shortages things like that um that they will find some stability in going forward and their outlook hopefully will continue to or start to improve. So the big challenge remains where um, with, with uh, really the comments that um, Philippa made, uh, namely, you know, the uh, bridging to policymakers so that uh, there is here a uh, consciousness for, you know, what uh, the labor force or, you know, at large, I should say, um, might be facing and how can we, how can uh, the, you know, the policymakers help in, in that respect? Would you agree with that, Philippa? Absolutely. And the, another thing I wanted to say about for, maybe for small businesses is shared work. If you have two people who could possibly share a job, that's, that's also been pretty effective, both in this recession and in the recession form, formerly known as the Great Recession. Well, I will again give you another chance, but this is the very, very last <laughs> chance to ask a question. Nobody wants to ask a question? I guess that, you know, this was very clear. And uh, I just want to thank um, the panel because um, it's fantastic to have an all-women panel. Just saying. <laughs> thank you. And I think that we have about five minutes that we can... Uh, um, ponder upon all uh, these uh, great, um, you know, ideas before we get to the next session. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So again, thank you so much from uh, down in Washington. And Philippa, where are you? I'm in upstate New York. In, in upstate Northern New York. And we are here. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much again.